Well, Professor Flug, uh, it's uh, I'd like to first I'd like to congratulate you on your as a recipient of the Distinguished 50-Year Member Award uh, yesterday. Thank you. And uh, your appearances defy the the fact that you got the 50-year award. You don't look to be that old a gentleman, or you must have started out pretty young. Uh, would you care to give us a brief uh, biological biographical sketch of your your life uh, and your family's birthplace, your parents? And well, I uh, started out in southern Indiana near Evansville, and uh, uh, I was uh, my father was uh, a farmer and a mechanic and a carpenter, and uh, I uh, went to uh, school in southern Indiana, and uh, then uh, decided I wanted to be an engineer and went to Purdue. I found it was quite different, and uh, after a couple of years, why? Well, uh, I had a uh, excursion to Europe, courtesy of Uncle Sam, uh, World War II, <laughs> and then after uh, after the war, <clears throat> well, during the war, I uh, uh, studied civil engineering at Ohio State University, and then after the war, I came back to Purdue and got a degree in uh, agricultural engineering, and also in general agriculture, uh, and uh, Later, uh, got a job teaching at the University of Massachusetts and uh, worked and got a uh, master's and PhD at the University of Massachusetts. And yeah, when, you, when did you get you married and have a family? And yes, uh, I, we, I was married while I was at Purdue and uh, I have uh, four living children and uh, I think it's 11 grandchildren. One of one of the uh, one of the children, Anne, is a civil engineer, uh, doing uh, construction management in the Twin Cities. They're all in the Twin City area. Or? No, she's the only one. Uh, I have a daughter in uh, uh, Hastings, Michigan, a son in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and a daughter in Steubenville, Ohio. Well. Had it always been your goal to be in the teaching field, or had you had other aspirations when oh, you first started in your, your college schooling? Well, I think that uh, my mother was a great one for education. Uh, uh, back in the year when she grew up, uh, there were limited opportunities, but she was uh, always pushing uh, for education, and uh, one of her uh, favorite uh, cousins uh, taught at Indiana University, and uh, I think that probably subliminally she was always uh, pushing us toward education, but uh, I didn't start out in that direction and arrived there sort of happenstance. Mm -hmm. What was the industry like at the time you started uh, teaching and uh, as compared to, say, today? Uh, what, what challenges did you have? And well, uh, my uh, first job was uh, with uh, uh, Professor Barr at Purdue in uh, uh, heating, ventilating uh, uh, agricultural buildings uh, for uh, storages. And uh, uh, that was in, in its infancy after the uh, Second World War. And then when I went to the University of Massachusetts, I uh, got involved in apple storage. Uh, uh, research and assistance to some of the growers and uh, the uh, typical refrigerating machine at that time was a reciprocating ammonia machine of about what 300 rpm or something like that and uh, uh, so the industry was uh, uh, was quite different in the in the fruit storage industry they had used um, Floor mounted diffusers, and in the period probably from 50 to 60, there was a big change toward uh, using ceiling mounted di diffusers <coughs> with uh, propeller fans rather than centrifugal fans. And uh, some of that is, has continued. And of course, uh, the uh, use of Freon then was, uh, was the main refrigerant. Mm -hmm. uh, 
was uh, most of your control on temperature control, or did you have to include the humidity? Uh, did, you, was it a, did you have to have a strict humidity control? And uh, very strict humidity control, uh, but that, in general, we got by uh, sort of insisting that they have a lot of coil surface mm -hmm. because you can't have uh, uh, low, or you can't have a high humidity with uh, not very much coil surface because then your delta T has to be uh, so great that uh, uh, that you just drop the moisture out in the coil. So, so one of the things we were preaching to to the growers, and uh, we worked when I got to Michigan State, uh, we worked with the Udell Refrigeration Company uh, a lot. They were in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and uh, I think what we did was we tried to encourage the growers to put in a lot of coil and a smaller machine. That maybe sounds funny, but if you put in a lot of coil and a smaller machine, you'll have a high humidity. If you put your money in the machine, and have a big machine and a small coil, mm -hmm. you won't have any humidity. What, uh, what's, what was your goal for uh, your standard for designing, and what relative humidity did you try to maintain? Well, 95 plus. Oh, okay. Saturated almost. Yes, yes. And your temperature? What temperature? Uh, we would run about 33 <coughs> degrees. Well, was this was this partially to control the ripening of the of the vegetables or the fruit, or was that the main goal? Or well, uh, starting when I was at at, at uh, University of Massachusetts, uh, I got involved in controlled atmosphere storage. We call it CA storage now in which you put the fruit in a sealed room. Uh, we would line the rooms with metal so that the diffusion rate through the walls was uh, very small. Uh, we uh, brought in things like a breather bag so that the fluctuations in pressure uh, wouldn't cause breathing of the room. And so you put the fruit in this room. Fruit is picked at optimum maturity and during uh, storage, the fruit, the fruit is alive, you know, fruit breathes. Uh, it breathes in oxygen and it breathes out carbon dioxide so that the, the fruit naturally will develop a low oxygen, high carbon dioxide atmosphere. Uh, you have to scrub out the carbon dioxide so that we had scrubbing systems for removing the carbon dioxide so that during the storage season, we would have about a 3% oxygen, 5% carbon dioxide in these rooms with about 95% or 96% humidity. And uh, if you go into the supermarket today, you will get CA apples, apples that come out of these controlled atmosphere storages. They may be from the Pacific Northwest or they may be from Michigan or, or local, but it's something that's now just done very widely. How long a period would you would you try to maintain be able to maintain the, the fruit or the vegetables in a, in a controlled atmosphere? Well, uh, we worked with primarily apples and pears. They do some other fruits now, but if, with apples, you would fill the storage uh, in October and hope to sell the apples in June and July or August, when when of course apples are in short supply. That's a long period of time. To that, that, that's <laughs> right. And every day you have to uh, uh, have a method for measuring the, the oxygen and carbon dioxide to be sure that uh, these levels are maintained because if the oxygen gets too low, then, it, then the fruit sort of dies mm -hmm. and uh, gets all flavors. And the same is with the carbon dioxide if it gets too high. Well, when, when did you uh, begin your role, uh, say, as a professor? At, uh, what, what years were those? Uh, well, I, I started uh, teaching. I, I was an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts in 1948, teaching strength of materials. Mm -hmm. And also at that time, I was assigned the job of teaching a course in refrigeration to food technology students. And uh, that's when I got involved with ash, uh, uh, with well, 
wasn't ASHRAE then, it was ASRE. Uh, the, uh, the people in the Connecticut Valley area were very helpful in educating me <laughs> on refrigeration so I could teach it because uh, I think I, I got just a smattering of, of uh, refrigeration in, at Purdue in, uh, uh, in thermal, in our uh, thermodynamics course in mechanical engineering. But uh, uh, to teach the students, I, I had to know how the thing worked. And so uh, Fred Riedel and some others in uh, the Connecticut Valley uh, made a refrigeration mechanic out of me so that I could put my own system together and then be able to explain it to the students. And we had a two-semester uh, course. First semester was on principles of refrigeration, and the second one was application freezing and uh, psychometry, uh, dehydration, and effective packaging materials on moisture loss and things like that. And then I went from there to Michigan State, and then I was there for 13 years and then to Minnesota. Back in the God's country. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We didn't have a getting in Minnesota. It's a matter of uh, maintaining warmer temperatures uh, most of the year. Yes, that, that's right. I uh, when I uh, came to Minnesota, I was involved with NASA uh, quite a lot in the space program uh, because uh, part of the I've been in refrigeration, heat transfer, and microbial control sterilization, which. Uh, and that took me in to some work with NASA. You talk about microbial control, is that really the, did you get into that with the fruit and the vegetables to keep them from spoiling or uh, that wouldn't apply there, would it? Or? Well, it would. Uh, I, uh, I got into that, uh, that, that, that was a project I worked on and uh, uh, it, it uh, if you're going to, let's say, take a can of food and preserve it, you need to heat it. We heat it, heat right. preserve. Right. And uh, this involves heat transfer. And basically, uh, I've been involved in, in the refrigeration and in heating and uh, cooling heat transfer, and as well as inf in instrumentation, because you have to be able to measure the temperature. Uh, this sort of gets to a point on with, with, uh, with ASHRAE. In the whole ASHRAE area, basically, the basic science you're dealing with is heating and cooling. It's really uh, a heat transfer, the whole thing is a heat transfer program, problem, with machinery to do it. And so the basic science is, is heat transfer, and the application is uh, all these wonderful devices that, that do it for us. Much, uh, you're, you're in a rather different field than the majority of uh, mechanical engineers that are there. They're thinking more of uh, human environmental control, and you're, and you're talking about a completely different field there well, than most of us would. Yes, that, that's right. Uh, but uh, I think the, uh, the, one of the interesting things uh, is that you have in, in, in the ASHRAE area, you have the machinery and the engineering. But the great bulk of the applications are biology. And uh, so somewhere you have to have biologists involved with engineers. And, and this is an interesting area because biologists do not think the same way as engineers think. And, and, engin vice, versa. and vice versa. <laughs> uh, it's, it's hard to to teach an engineer to think like a biologist. And um, it's equally hard to, to teach a biologist to think like an engineer. And see, I came up uh, in, in agriculture in one sense, in that I grew up in agriculture. But basically, I'm an engineer. And many people don't, many people in the microbial control area don't look at me as an engineer. They look at me as a microbiologist. And I think that being on both sides of this, uh, I can see some of the problems that inv are involved and maybe opportunities also. And I think it's important that ASHRAE uh, work to keep biologists involved. Uh, I know they're hard to live with sometimes. You know, it's, 
uh, when I was, there was a time when I preferred to drive a tractor to driving mules. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are times when the mules, you have to have them. And it's sort of that way with the biologist. I think that, that uh, uh, biologists are different than engineers, but you need that input because uh, the biological organism, see, is, is uh, infinitely variable. If you make a refrigerating machine, uh, when I remember going through a Westinghouse plant, and this was before machining was perhaps as precise as it is today, but they uh, honed the cylinders on these small compressors, and then they ground the pistons, and they classified them. They didn't say, I'm going to make the pistons all this size and the, uh, and the cylinders all this size. They, they realized that they couldn't do that. So what they did is they fitted pistons uniquely to cylinders. And in that way, they, they uh, were able to accomplish uh, what they wanted. But I think most engineers think that if they make a machine, all of their machines are going to be the same. Uh, when you're dealing with biology, uh, there are five of us here. We're five different animals. Five, and, and so you have to deal with the variability in biology. And that's one thing that's very hard often for engineers to recognize uh, this variability. Have you noticed any uh, over the years? I mean, changes in the I mean, how how equipment has advanced uh, as far as refrigerating machines. And well, there's 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 no. That, that's a big <laughs> question. <laughs> there's a wide span here, isn't there? Well, the the uh, the obvious major change has been the the bringing in of uh, of digital controls, and uh, I think higher speed machines. Uh, uh, that are uh, supposedly more efficient, and then there's all this change in the refrigerants. We were when I I worked mainly with R12 and R22, which uh, no longer exist. You've got new refrigeration refrigerants that are used now. Well, with with the new refrigerants, could you adapt them to your field, or rather replace the R12 and 22, or would that be a Unsurmountable project for you. Well, uh, you know it can it can be done. Uh, you you um, if it has to be done, it can be done. I think that's that's uh, that's and if the money is there. To <laughs> that, <laughs> that's <laughs> right. That's that's over. that's very very true. That's very true. Uh, the um, I think this this getting. Uh, since I straddle this line between biology and engineering, uh, some points that I might uh, make on that is that uh, the areas that these two groups work in are different. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the engineers are most all working for companies, and uh, if you have engineers in your company and you want them to go to the ASHRAE meeting, you pay their way and pay all the expenses. If you're working for academia, we don't have quite that same uh, privilege because uh, uh, the, the funds come in a different way and uh, uh, we have to worry more about how, how we get to meetings. And uh, I think that, that ASHRAE and in dealing with the biologists, which are outside, they aren't employees of companies. They may be working for the government or a a academia. Uh, they need to find, ASHRAE needs to find a way to encourage these people to come to the meetings mm -hmm. and get involved. And uh, uh, I don't have the answer to that, but I think it's an important problem that, that, needs, to be uh, that needs to be solved for the benefit of the organization. Do you think there's a problem uh, as far as some of the, uh, the fees that are charged, like, say, the ash rate uh, conventions and things like that? Or would they be out of the range of uh, the average uh, biologist or teacher <laughs> or professor? 
they're, they're, they are. I think that uh, I think the difference is that people working in your company, if they go to the meeting, you will pay their registration fee, you will pay their hotel bill, you will provide them with an airline ticket. Uh, I might have to do all that myself, and uh, so it, it, it makes it. Uh, I have to want worse than. Well, I can understand what you're saying. I, being retired, I don't have a company. To that, pay my that's that's either, that's so. exactly right. But uh, the, the younger people, if you if you think about a, a young scientist who has a, a young family uh, and is interested in the area and wants to go, it. it if he goes, it's it's really a financial hardship, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, sometimes uh, uh, the, the funds just aren't available in academia for this travel. Mm -hmm. Not that not I don't I don't mean to say that academia is poor because there's there's always money for what needs mm -hmm. to be done, but sometimes it's an, a new building rather than going to a meeting. Of course, that's dependent upon the economy, also. You're that's you're right. That's right. Years and so forth. Uh, you got, you're talking about the microbe biology. Biology. <laughs> I had a tongue twister there. Uh, you're, you were involved in the clean room design, were you mentioned? Or? Yes, I, I uh, uh, deal in clean rooms. Uh, a, a clean room, it's, a, it's a, almost a misnomer uh, in the, the clean is relative, but in general, what we mean by clean rooms are the ideal is that you have the ceiling is uh, HEPA filters, high efficiency particulate filters, uh, and you're re uh, recycling the air and humidifying it, maintaining, let's say, 50% humidity. And supposedly, in a well operating clean room, the, la the velocity from the face of the filters is about 100. Uh, feet, and uh, uh, the idea is that these, this you'll get streamlined flow, and this will carry the mi microorganisms out of the room and back, and they'll be right. caught in the filters. If if I am a worker in this clean area beside a machine that's filling capsules or or a, a solution, uh, there is this air barrier between me and the product. And that protects the product. And uh, we're doing more things to uh, uh, try to get the person farther away from uh, the filling line. Uh, uh, starting in the early 90s, I had a project with TL Systems, you may know them, and Dispatch Industries mm -hmm. in uh, uh, building a, uh, a literally a clean room in a, a box where the people are on the outside. That's uh, a, a tunnel, and uh, uh, it, it's an advance in uh, being able to uh, manufacture sterile products. In microbial control, uh, you can package the product. You can put the product in the package and then s subject the package to some kind of a sterilization treatment. Mm -hmm. or you can sterilize the product first and then put it in the package. Uh, and when you sterilize the product first and what we say aseptically package it, that's where the clean room comes in because you, you have to do this packaging in an atmosphere where it's not contaminated with microorganisms. Is it possible to, I mean, I, I would think that they could, uh, could they package the product uh, Mechanically, I mean, using ro robot controls and things like that, uh, so that you don't have a human close to the product. Yes, but uh, if you're running at uh, 700 vials per minute, yeah. <laughs> it, it jams once in a while, okay. and when it jams, you have to have human intervention. And uh, um, in our tunnels, uh, we we put gloves in them. So that, uh, uh, like a glove box yeah. with at the, in the hospital or other environmental area, so that the individual can intervene uh, with a, a tweezer on the end of the glove or something to clear the s jam. Yeah, and so the human yeah. wouldn't be in this so-called sterile area. Right? Exactly right. Mm -hmm. How about the uh, the high velocities? Uh, 
I mean, uh, I would think with this vertical laminal, laminar flow, uh, you wouldn't be aspirating any of the room air or oh, any of those other things. Well, in the tunnel, it's contained. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a room such that you would just say that this were the clean room, mm -hmm. uh, the, the whole ceiling, the air would be coming down from the whole ceiling. Or the piston or the yeah. cushion would touch. And you might even have uh, a uh, flexible curtain next to the line so that the individual is standing on the outside line. The, the individual is really a machine operator. And he only needs to, to intervene if, if there's a problem. But uh, these machines are complex and intervention is necessary. Can you think of any people that stand out that influence you in your, your profession or early years? Or? Well, my uh, first introduction to uh, Heating and ventilating was a gentleman by the name of Bill Miller, Professor Bill Miller at Purdue. Mm -hmm. And he taught a very interesting heating and ventilating course. And then I went to work for uh, Professor Barr uh, in agricultural engineering. And I learned psychrometrics from Dr. Barr. He uh, uh, was, uh, I think, quite ahead of his time as, as far as using psychrometrics and things. And, um, then there was the group at, uh, in Connecticut, uh, Mr. Riedel and others who, who helped educate me, told me how to make uh, uh, joints. Uh, you're talking about humorous events. Uh, I had, uh, I was building, I built my own walk-in cooler. And uh, my boss gave me an auto mechanic to help me do the copper piping on this uh, box. And when we had it done and we put compressed air in it, it just leaked like a sieve. And he said to me, but it'll hold gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, we, that's when I learned how to make uh, flare fittings and make them tight and so that they didn't leak. I had to go back over and make all the flare fittings over and uh, we had a good system after that. Well, you're you're, like you said before, you're in a rather unique field of, in mechanical engineering or in our field, uh, heating and refrigeration. What advice would you give a, a young person just getting into the profession to, to follow your, your guideline, your uh, approach to the industry, or I suppose it'd be whatever he would feel comfortable in or enjoy. I, I uh, when I was at Michigan State, I had a young man come in uh, uh, to work for me, uh, Ron Fisher, and uh, Ron was really uh, uh, an energetic young man, and uh, he came in just technician, hadn't been, gone to college or anything, and uh, we, working in the lab, thought that he really had promise, so we encouraged him to learn refrigeration. And uh, uh, he went to school uh, and nights and so forth. And he, we had a number of environmental chambers then at that time, which he was taking care of. And uh, I think about four years later, he went to work for Myers Supermarkets and later was uh, uh, in charge of all the refrigeration at Myers Supermarket. Mm -hmm. I, I think that there's a, a wonderful fr future for people in refrigeration. Uh, I have yet to see a refrigerating machine that didn't require service very often. And, <laughs> and, and it's an interesting, it's a, I think it's a challenging area. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, whether they, they go, uh, Ron Fisher, he, he, he went as a technician, uh, uh, an, uh, an, uh, a technologist in, in, in being able to troubleshoot and solve the problems, or whether uh, the individual goes in and uh, gets a degree and goes into the area. I, I think it's a good area. I, uh, uh, it, uh, I think it's a challenging area, uh, and uh, 
I've, I've had a lot of fun. I, I think I enjoy doing the refrigeration part, the hands-on, more than the writing. I, I've done a lot of writing. I have to do a lot of writing. But it's, it's a lot of fun to put together a re refrigerating machine and see the thing works. You know, it's a, it's a fascinating area. Are you still uh, active in, uh, in uh, giving courses at the university? Or? Yes, we're, we're, we, uh, we've been giving a three-day uh, course for a number of years, and we'll give one in St. Paul in uh, September. And um, it's, uh, it's an interesting course. I, I haven't seen it used too much. It's, it's a lecture problem course, and uh, I think it comes from my engineering background. We have a problem book. And this is this is microbiology, you might say. We call it microbiology and engineering. But we lecture an hour, and the students have to work a problem, a simple problem. Uh, you might think it's equivalent to uh, finding some values on a psychometric chart. But they have to take, they have to pick up the pencil, and they have to get some values. And then we give them an answer sheet, and then we lecture a little longer, and we do this for three days. And it's, it, to me, it's been a most effective way of teaching. It, uh, we, we've had a lot of success with it. Do you have any other comments you'd care to talk about? Or? Well, I, uh, I think uh, that, that uh, my experience with ASHRAE has been very good. I, I haven't been active as I should have been the last 10, 15 years. You know, there's only so much that you can do. So many hours that, a day. That's right. I, I continue to read the literature. And uh, uh, I may build my own little apple storage this summer. Uh, uh, if I can find a, uh, a uh, I suppose you'd say a packaged air conditioner, a little box that will get down to 35 degrees, that I can build this little uh, insulated box and put this in and have a, have a refrigerated storage. Uh, so I'm, I'm still interested. I think it's... Uh, uh, just a, an interesting area. And uh, I think there's an opportunity for anybody, uh, you know, at all levels in ASHRAE, and I think that's one of the good things of uh, the, the individual can participate at many different levels. So. Well, I'd like to uh, extend a personal invitation to you to attend one of our Minnesota chapter meetings. Uh, if you see a topic uh, schedule that would be of interest to you, I mean, we'd certainly like to have you there? Well, thank you. It's uh, it's been quite a while since I've been to one. I'm, uh, you know, as time goes on, you, you don't get to as many meetings as you'd yeah, like to. That's true. But <laughs> you see some young, very brilliant engineers nowadays in the yes. in the ASHRAE field. Well, it's been a pleasure interviewing you, Doctor. Well, Professor. it's been a pleasure talking to you about ASHRAE and and the things that I've done. Thank you.